since I returned to the Fair Commonwealth of Virginia 13 months ago. And I have to say, you guys, it's a completely different ethos. You were talking about the rotaries in, in Hawaii. It is a different ethos in different states. The, the Rotarian experience I got, my introduction was the clubs in Kentucky, and it is a different world out here. And I say that not in a negative sense, it's just completely different. They never serenaded me like you guys did this morning. Uh, but, so I, but I do appreciate it. It's obvious that this is an active and energetic group, and that's, quite frankly, what you want. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the MacArthur Memorial, what we're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, what's been going on. Um, I know a couple of people mentioned my predecessor, Bill Davis, was here about two years ago, two and a half years ago to kind of talk. And so kind of a, think of this kind of something of an update based on that. And if we've got some time afterwards, be happy to, to answer any questions that we may, that you guys may have. Just out of curiosity, by show of hands, how many of you have been to the memorial in the last two years? Okay, good. For the rest of you, we hope to see you soon. Um, just real quick, I want to start off by talking, just start kind of cosmically and talk about who we are and why we're here. This is our 50th anniversary year. We were founded in 1964. The de facto dedication of the memorial occurred with General MacArthur's interment on April 11, 1964. It's a museum and archive dedicated to the life and times of General MacArthur, who's buried in the rotunda, as I just mentioned, in the memorial's rotunda, with his wife, Jean, who died 15 years ago this coming January at the age of 101. Let's talk about full life. The city of Norfolk operates the memorial in close partnership with the nonprofit General Douglas MacArthur Foundation. Bill Davis, for those of you who know him, wore two hats for, for about 15 years. He was director of the memorial and director of the foundation. Well, about 16, about 13, 14 months ago, he put down the city hat, and that's the one that I wear. But I still work very, very closely with him, and it's a partnership very much like this to move forward toward our respective plans and our respective goals. One thing I will point out to you, I talked about the fact just a second ago that we are both a museum and we are an archive. And I want to talk real quick about audience, because this is something that goes back to when General MacArthur donated his items to the city of Norfolk back in the early 60s. So the memorial will be free and it will be open to all. Which, not to put too fine a point on it, <clears throat> excuse me, in the early 1960s in the South, 
is a bit of a radical statement. We look at a visit, we take that mandate still and look at it big tent. We look at our, our audience from a very wide perspective. Indeed, 20% of the people that come to the memorial are international. Just yesterday, I had a group from Japan who was here and said, Douglas MacArthur is the most famous non-Japanese in their country. The same is true in South Korea, and the same is true in the Philippines as well. So we draw quite a bit. In fact, we get people that come to Hampton Roads from around, literally halfway around the world to come to the MacArthur Memorial. So we are a public face of the city of Norfolk, we are a public face of Hampton Roads, and we are an international face of this region and of this state. And uh, so that's something right off the bat I want to point out, is that we are a treasure not just for the region, not just for the, the city, but for the, the, the country, and internationally also. We have a great international profile. I'm going to make a dangerous assumption and assume most of you probably know where we are, but I'm going to review it anyway. Um, we're right in the heart of downtown Norfolk in the old city hall, built 1850, and then converted, purpose converted to the MacArthur Memorial in the early 1960s. Free and open to the public. <coughs> best price you can find, best admission price you can find. Free, <coughs> open to the public. We're open six days a week, we're closed Mondays. We get about 40,000 visitors, <coughs> plus or minus each year, although I think it's going to be definitely plus this year. We're already up 15% visitation this year, 25% over the summer months. We've got a couple of major upcoming initiatives that I'll talk about here in just a sec related to the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the Philippines and also the centennial of the First World War. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the things we've got going on because we've one of the things that we find, at least on me philosophically, is all the museums that I've been at, you know, the, one of the common things is, well, what's new? You know, I've been there, I've seen the exhibits, you know, what's new? What's changed? Well, two ways you keep a museum fresh, you keep it new, and you keep people coming back is changing exhibits, which I'll talk about here in a minute, and educational program. And let me give you a taste of some of the things that we've got going on that serve both of those ends. Recently, and you can find this on C-SPAN on Norfolk News Now because they filmed it, um, we did a program in conjunction with the Norfolk Historical Society called The Guns of August, The Great War in Norfolk. If you really think about it, the modern city of Norfolk and the modern Hampton Roads that we know today has its roots in the First World War. That's when the Naval Station, that's when Langley Air Force Base, that's when uh, Little Creek, those are all founded in the expansion in 1917. And so that's what this program talked about. You can find it online. We did that in August. We hosted the NATO Military Committee for a, uh, they were here, you may have seen it in the paper a couple weeks ago. Um, we hosted them for a program and then I did a, uh, walked them through the alliance and, and some, of, some of the lessons of the Korean War for them to take away. A couple things we've got coming up. We're hosting Norfolk's Veterans Day Ceremony, uh, 1400, 2 p.m. In, in civilian time on the 11th of November in our visitor center, followed by a wreath laying at General MacArthur's grave. Um, so if you're interested, come on down and check that out. And then on the 14th and 15th of November, in conjunction with Old Dominion, the Hampton Roads Naval Museum, the Naval Historical Foundation, and Southern Bank, we're putting on an international World War I symposium, talking about the beginning of the war 100 years later. Um, this involves scholars from four countries, involves attendees from four countries, 17 states in the District of Columbia. And a lot of these people are coming here specifically for this. And I will tell you something too, and I told this to, to some of the folks at the table over breakfast. Several months ago, I was in Kansas City, Missouri. I wasn't there to watch baseball, although they went nuts for the Royals even then. But I was there and I visited the uh, CEO of the National World War I Museum that's out there. And he had seen what we had planned this November, and he said it was better than anything they had on their calendar. So this, we are, we have really become a national leader in the centennial of the First World War. And I'll get back to that here in just a second, because that's a major, major push for us. Um, the last thing I'll point out to you is, is if, you, if you've been in the last couple of years, you may have noticed in our new visitor center, which opened two years ago this month, we have a 5,000 square foot exhibit gallery on MacArthur's 42nd Division in the First World War. That's going to close in about three weeks. And then in early February, right at the 70th anniversary of the Battle for Manila, largest urban battle in the Pacific Theater, very comparable in many ways to the Warsaw Uprising or to Stalingrad, we're going to open a new exhibit. It's going to be up for two years called Bittersweet Victory. 
the liberation of the Philippines. And we're working with some partners, among them the Philippine Embassy. We hosted a reception a few months ago to uh, commemorate the various 70th anniversaries of the liberation of the Philippines starting in October of 1944 and going to the end of the war in August of 1945. We're going to be doing some related programming. We're working up our 2015 programming calendar now. Stay tuned. It's going to be really cool. <coughs> As I mentioned, we're pushing the Philippine liberation as one of our big programming priorities, but one of our other big programming priorities is the World War I Centennial. As I mentioned, we're a leader in the World War I Centennial in the United States. Quite frankly, we're out of the gate, a lot of ways, out of the gate, ahead of most other people in a lot of ways. We're pushing this nationally, but we're also pushing this internationally, and we're engaging a lot of partners over in Europe and over in the Far East also. One of the things that we have, and I encourage you to check out our website if you haven't been on it lately, MacArthurMemorial.org. You can always Google MacArthur Memorial and pop right up anyway. But one of the things we have on there, we're doing a series of films, 10-minute films, that cover the entire war. And we've got two already in. The first one covers the causes. The second one covers the guns of August. If you've read the book, The Guns of August, it covers that period. August, September, 1914 battles east on the eastern front and the western front. The whole idea behind this is to make this accessible to the general public, but especially to school children. And we've designed, um, and they're tied into the standards of learning, uh, but we've designed educational packets for teachers. And we've presented this at the national and the statewide social studies conferences this year and last year. And let me tell you, people love it. There are a lot of schools with the centennial that are coming. We're starting to hear the teachers are getting mandates from their school system saying, you need to talk about this. You need to talk about this, particularly as we get to 2017 and U.S. involvement. We're the only people that are producing any kind of material right now. And so we're, we're the, it's giving us a tremendous leg up and really introducing us to a new audience and to the next generation of our visitors. When I talk about how education materials can make you relevant, can make you fresh, can keep, oh yeah, why, you know, why should I come back? You know, what's, what's going on? This is an example right here. We're engaging the next generation of, of our visitors coming in and helping them understand what this place is, what it means, and the great stories we have in it. Um, so that's something that's coming up. You can view those. We've got them on YouTube. We've got them on our website. You can check them out there. Um, as I mentioned, the website is MacArthurMemorial.org. I encourage you to check that out. Um, got a lot of great stuff on there. We just did a revamp, web, revamp the website back in uh, June, July. So if you haven't been on there lately, it's got some great stuff in the events calendar, things like that. And also, find us on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, please find us. We are listed as General Douglas MacArthur Found uh, Memorial. It, uh, we post different things about different events, MacArthur anniversaries, things of that nature. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out. Kind of good way to kind of keep tabs on what we're doing. Now, there are a couple things that I do want to mention in the, in the little bit of time I have left. I do know we all have to get to work. Uh, but there are a couple things I want to mention, and I, I want to kind of peel back the onion a little bit on General MacArthur, because I think these, I think particularly with some of the anniversaries we're at right now, I think it's a good, good glimpse behind the man. You know, working at the Patton Museum before, and now working here at MacArthur Memorial, I find that a lot of these iconic American generals, there's too much, there's a little bit of a distance between the American public and these generals. And a lot of people, for example, view George Patton as George C. Scott. <laughs> Patton actually had a very high voice. People, when, when people saw, see footage of Patton speaking, like, that's not Patton. So actually, George C. Scott is the George Patton that Patton wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas MacArthur is, the, the phrase has been used to describe other, other iconic American generals, but I think it's true here, the marble man. People view him as something of a remote figure that exists in black and white photographs. But this is a regular person, just like you and I. And let me make a couple of comments here that, that that may help kind of kind of put that together. But before I do that, I want to note a couple, two or three things. I see a couple. Of, I see at least one Marine veteran in here. I know there are a couple of Navy vets in here. Does anybody know that MacArthur's were Navy? Was a Navy family too? Yeah. MacArthur's older brother went to Annapolis, and he commanded a cruiser during the First World War. He was a he was a captain until appendicitis killed him in 1923. He was on his way for his flag. So, the MacArthur's were a Navy family, and Douglas MacArthur. You know, for all of the stereotypes of him, you know, his, his, you know, 
d debates and, and the headbutting with the Navy in the Second World War, things like that, even the headbutting with the Marines, all the stereotypes. He understood exactly what the Navy meant. In fact, if you've ever heard the phrase Navy Marine Corps team, I don't know if that's familiar to many of you. I see some heads nodding. Do you know the first instance that I found where that was used? General MacArthur used it at Incheon when he was talking about, and when he was talking, he was making the case for Incheon, and he was talking to the CNO and to the chief of staff of the Army, and he says, I have more faith in the Navy Marine Corps team than they do in themselves. This landing can occur. So that should, I offer that to you as, all, as well. The other thing that I would point out to you is MacArthur the symbol. We talk about MacArthur the icon, but MacArthur the symbol shows up in today's headlines. An echo of General MacArthur's legacy shows up in today's headlines. Because what ship is coming home today? And what battle is that ship named after? The USS Bataan. The first USS Bataan was a light aircraft carrier, CVL, that was under construction in 1942 while MacArthur was defending the Philippines. And because, really, quite, to be quite honest with you, if you look at the first six months of the Pacific War up to Coral Sea in, in uh, May of 1942, that with two exceptions, Wake Island, the Marines on Wake Island, and MacArthur in the Philippines, the Allies get defeated everywhere else. There's only two places where the Japanese are stopped, even on a temporary basis. And so General MacArthur becomes a, an international symbol. If you go to Washington today, I forget which square it is, but it's not far from the White House, they renamed two streets, Baton and Corregidor Street. And MacArthur Boulevard in Georgetown is named, named for him at that time. Well, that's also where the first USS Baton comes from. And it's a name that has continued forward, and that legacy of General MacArthur continues forward and is literally in the headlines this very morning. So that's something about the effect. Again, MacArthur, the icon I've been talking about. Let me talk about the man here real fast, because I think this is important. How many of you have ever seen this very famous photograph? It's this plus the Iwo Jima, the Joe Rosenthal flag raising, are probably the two most iconic photographs of the Pacific War. General MacArthur waiting ashore at late day, October 20th, 1944. Incidentally, this is right where the hurricane struck a year ago. MacArthur, when he left the Philippines in 1942 by direct presidential order, <clears throat> first of all, he fought an entire battle with his wife and son at his side, which puts additional strain aside from the political and military strain that he's under. <coughs> but when MacArthur retired from the Army, he moved to Manila in the 30s. He picked up and took his entire household with him. He has to leave it to the Japanese on Christmas Eve, 1941. Merry Christmas, 1941. We've got to leave Manila and go to Corregidor. And all we can take is a small bag of peace on the boat, and we don't know when we're coming back. So that all, his father's library, his father's papers, all of the family possessions, furniture, pay, think of all the stuff that you have in your house that you used to live your day by and, and stuff in your attic, things like that. That's what MacArthur left behind in his penthouse suite in the Manila Hotel. So when he says, I shall return in April of 1940, March of 1942, it's personal. It's not professional. He has been working for six years to prepare the Philippines for independence. The Japanese have pretty much blown that to, to smithereens, literally and figuratively. Imagine the emotional impact all of that has on him by the time he gets to Australia. And by the way, his stuff, he is basically homeless because his home is now under Japanese occupation. And we know it was because the Japanese did a very thorough job inventorying the apartment. Everything that MacArthur does from that moment forward is geared toward this moment here, getting back to the Philippines. There are military reasons. There are political reasons, there are moral reasons for him, and there are personal reasons. So it's a combination of things. But this, you know, we look at this picture and, oh, MacArthur's waiting ashore, you know, all this other, you know, and there's a lot of things that can be said about this photograph, you know, MacArthur the showman, things like that. And that is, there is something to that. But when it comes down to it, people forget the personal angle. People forget that this is one step closer to home. By the way, the Americans returned to Manila in 1945. 
During the fighting, the Manila Hotel is a Japanese strong point. And from the roof of the Manila Hotel, fire is placed upon American forces. And the apartment, the penthouse, is completely destroyed, along with the MacArthur's possessions. If you go to the museum today, you'll notice that we have, our artifacts are kind of thin and spotty in places until you get to World War II. And then there's a lot of stuff to see from then forward. That's because just about everything else had been destroyed in the Manila Hotel. So that's something to keep in mind. Some of the things that we do have, and this is another personal angle, and then, I'm going, then I'll wrap up, um, is some of the things that we have is MacArthur's miniature medals, his field marshal's baton from the Philippines, um, we have his wife's wedding rings, and we have a couple other personal possessions. We have the birth certificate of their son, Arthur. We have their marriage certificate, things of that nature. That's because MacArthur wrote his will on Corregidor in February of 1942. He didn't think he was going to get out. And so when a supply submarine had arrived in, in, on Corregidor and was taking out the U.S. High Commissioner and some, of, some other personnel, they put a footlocker in the hold of that submarine and said, put this in the Riggs Bank in Washington. Somebody will claim it. I don't know who. It may be us. Somebody will claim this that we will designate. He wrote his will in the middle of the battle for Bataan. That is another personal angle that people don't think about. We look at this man as an icon. We look at this man as a, as a statue in front, of a, in front of the building downtown. We look at this man as a series of black and white photographs. But we should never, ever forget. He, just like every other person in these black and white photographs and in history, are people just like us with hopes and dreams and feelings and reactions just like us. And that is one of the things that we convey at the MacArthur Memorial, is telling that story and helping people understand who this man was, what he stood for, what he did, and why this place matters. So if you haven't been down lately, even if you have, come on back and see us. Check out our website. Like us on Facebook. We've got a lot of great stuff going on. We've had an amazing first 50 years as an icon of Hampton Roads in Norfolk. And we're going to have, I'm already looking forward to the next 50 also. Folks, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple questions. You mentioned the website. If you haven't been there before, go out the website and take the virtual tour that's on the website, and it'll whet your appetite to go down and see the actual place. Great. Thank you. I did not pay to pay him to say that. <laughs> Charlie, I was just at Pearl Harbor on Monday and stood in the spot where that, that was signed, and of course they gave a lot of information about the general. But I think the most interesting thing with Bashir here, you know this, that the Japanese representative was two minutes late, and he would not come on deck, and he said, I will not be on deck first. So it's supposed to be at 4 o'clock, and he came out at 4 03, because the Japanese gentleman got there at 4 02. And he was, uh, he was a Samurai warrior, and he said he'd rather been killed than signed, but he was ordered by the emperor to sign that document. The young woman had the wooden leg. That's right. The other thing was an Australian told me that we saved their ass at, 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 um, at the Battle of the Coral Seas. He thanked me. This is, this is a long time. So he thank, thank Mr. General MacArthur, don't thank me. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because the a ANZUS, A-N-Z-U-S Alliance, when were the seeds planted? It was when John Curtin, the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, requested to Franklin Roosevelt and said, the British have lost Singapore, they've lost the Prince of Wales and Repulse, all the props, and one, one quarter of our overseas army was surrendered in Singapore, the British can't help us, they got their own problems. I need American support, and I need an American commander. Well, the best American commander that was fighting the Japanese at the time that Roosevelt could think about was Douglas MacArthur. That is the seeds for the strong alliance that we have with the Australians to this day. And you're absolutely right. They remember. They know. And they remember. Absolutely. Well, another thing that you didn't mention, the fact that he was born in my, my hometown. <laughs> you know, yeah. well, I didn't know it was your hometown. <laughs> <laughs> he used to, used to play, it, as a kid, he used to play in MacArthur Park. Little bit, That's, little bit. That's right. His father was stationed there. One more question. Anybody? Well, I've got one question. Sure. For those of us that are not familiar with all the history of MacArthur, um, 
good reading material. A book over two. American Caesar by William Manchester. Right. Yeah. Tells tells a great story. Very good. Cool. We, we sell it in our gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it tells a great story and is a great introduction to the man. So great. It's, it's a highly readable book. That would be my recommendation. Good. Thank you. joining us, you know how to find us. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. And one more thing. We need you to draw the winning lottery ticket for the morning. And read the last three numbers. Last three numbers. Two, two, two. No. <laughs> you got that yours? Oh, Phil won. Okay. I'm not going to say anything 